Well, good morning, dear friends. Thank you for joining us this morning. That's another woman sitting here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Sunday Fellowship. Uh, we have had the pleasure of uh, having our dear brother and sister, Chris and uh, Marlinda Serios with their daughter, Brittany. They've joined us in fellowship this morning. And, and you know, as we said before, live broadcast, I mean, stuff, you know, this, you, 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 I mean, I'm really excited about live broadcast because stuff happens. Well, uh, my wife decided, apart from me, you know what I'm saying? Apart from me, to ask my Linda to sit in and sit here next to me. So she, she believes that's going to settle me down, really. But <laughs> you know me. So, my Linda, it's good to have you, sis. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> and, uh, We've got uh, her head, and which is his beautiful body of love, with me. They just had their anniversary. We said that a few weeks ago when, when we were broadcasting. But uh, it is always good to gather as a family. So as we start, we're going to pray, and uh, we're going to continue. with What we, the Father, has given us to talk about again this week is desensitization to the person of Christ and politics. So, Melinda, would you pray for us? Sure. Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here today. Father, give David the words that you would have each of us hear and give us the hearts and minds to receive and understand the way you want us to know. We love you and praise you and come to you as your sons. Amen. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> we are going to take off uh, this morning. Uh, I've got a, I got a couple of emails, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it a little differently than I thought I would, Jim. Uh uh, I'm going to read one of the emails, and I, I think I mentioned not too long ago about desensitization. Now, the reason I'm reading this email, let me lay a little foundation. Somebody said to me in the last week, uh, you're going to be, I mean, you're in desensitization. And, and they gave it to me as though the answer was desensitization, as though, come on, you know, we've heard this for several months, you know, you know like, uh, is there something else? And so I didn't say anything. And so I uh, uh, meditated on that a minute. And so the Father gave me a word, and it was this. <coughs> he showed me the Father's house. We were in the Father's house, and I saw uh, someone come up to him and say, you know, Father, we've been, uh, we've, been, we've been looking at this thing on the lamb for eons now. Is there something else you can give us besides us talking about the lamb? <laughs> can you give us something else besides talking about the lamb? And I thought, you know, what's real to us is what? Life to us. And what's life to us, we do what? We live. And so the in Christ position is real in me. I'm not, and I can't speak for you, but I know it is to you, too. And it's life. So I never get tired of saying things about the in Christ position. Well, de desensitization has become a part of that idea. It's a God idea. I'm sure glad she's lowered in the camera. Isn't that great? <laughs> a granddaughter walking around, and she's about this big, and it's under the camera. I just, I just love this activity, man. It's, it's just cool. Come here, Carmen. Come here, sweetie. And so I like the idea of talking about desensitization to the person of Christ. Did she go, see, kids, <laughs> when you want them, they don't want to come. When you don't want them, they always, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that idea gripped me. And so I was saying uh, that when something's real to you and it's life to you and you live it spontaneously, it's not anything you get enough of. For instance, uh, when you've experienced the love of Christ, you can't get enough of that love. When you've experienced a friendship with someone and you want to be around them, you don't, you don't say, hey, look, we've been friends for like 35 years, so look, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. I mean, <laughs> I need to find other people to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the idea. I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again. The Father did not send me to entertain you. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to share the revelation of the mystery of Christ in me, which, if he's in you, is a part of your revelation as well. So, you know, 
But I got this email from our dear sister in, uh, in uh, I've talked about Rachel before. Rachel is in Mississippi. Hang on a minute. Come here. Let me see. Come here, baby. Let me, let's let everybody see who you are. I'm right here, babe. Look, look, Grandma. Carmen. Oh, my gosh. She's you're, on you're camera. On She's on camera. <laughs> All right. Well, that settled that. That fixed it. <laughs> I'm not going next to him again. Nope. But anyway, Rachel uh, sent this uh, is an email, but I just want to pluck out something she said. <clears throat> if you'll give me the opportunity here. She said, uh, I do have some questions but have not emailed them uh, again because I you know, didn't want to be annoying. In the most recent message, I am seeing that desensitization is the core of most of the confusion about God and his word. It is also amazing to me that when the Bible is read, we sometimes don't read it the way it was written. We read it, we read what uh, we have heard, we have always heard. We read what we've always heard. She goes on to say that, uh, for example, in one of the messages you stated that God didn't kill animals to get skins to cover Adam and Eve. I went and read it over again, and sure enough, <laughs> exclamation point. I'm looking forward to having some dedicated study time. Thanks, Rachel. Desensitization to her is the core of what she's seeing and learning today. So I guess, uh, I'm not going to say I guess, I'm thankful that the Father has stirred her up because it is what's real to us, that's life to us, that makes us or brings us to a place to really get our mind renewed. I got another email. Now this one pertains, I made cop out to Sabrina. Our dear sister Sabrina in Colorado, Sabrina says she's going to be watching this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she sent a, an email to me about something I said last week when we were talking about uh, desensitization of personal Christ and religion. And I made the statement that God is not dealing with nations. He is dealing with individuals. And so she sent me an email. This is what it says. Because she wanted, I told her I was going to answer the question. Normally I don't answer questions. I try not to answer questions if it's not on topic. But this was kind of good in the sense that uh, uh, the question relates to what we said. She said, uh, one question, you mentioned that the Father deals with individuals now, but will deal with nations later. I know he'll be dealing with Israel and surrounding nations for one. And I am thinking you may have had the millennial, millennium in mind. I did not have the millennium in mind, Sabrina. Is there something else? I'd like to know because it drives me crazy, capital, when I say that God deals with individuals, not nations. You, uh, you know what I mean. Yes. So uh, let me try to uh, give you what, give her what the question was. That must be something else. The reason people do not grasp individuals versus nation is because, one, we don't understand the cross. Two, because national identity is important to our identity. National identity is important to our identity. And so if I tell you God's not dealing with nations, what are you going to do with America? If you're in France and you're looking at we we what is God going to do with France? The same thing he did with America or or Israel, or Japan, or China, or any place else. So I've got a few notes here, Sabrina. Now I'm going to ask Jim as we finish, because Jim always put the notes next to the uh, the upload, the, the 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 video. And I've got some. I didn't send these out <clears throat> this morning because I didn't want to send them out. I wanted us to. I knew you guys were going to be here, so I just kind of wanted us to take a look at this. So. <clears throat> My Linda, yeah. it's your turn. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How about taking it from that second paragraph? From Genesis chapter 10, where we see the word nation used to the cross, God dealt with man or mankind through nations. 
The scripture says he promised to make Abram a great nation in Genesis 12, 2. It also says he promised to make Ishmael a great nation in Genesis 17, 20, and 21, 13, and verse 18. Oh, well. Now, do you understand right now God is saying something about nations? First, he tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a what? Great nation. Then he tells Abraham, or Abram, and, well, he's Abraham now, in Genesis 17, I'm going to make Ishmael a great nation. Same thing. So he's dealing with nations. He's taking individuals and telling them, individuals, that they are going to become what? A, a nation. So he then tells Abraham again in 2113, look, I've already told you I got Ishmael covered. I got Ishmael covered, my Linda. I'm going to make him a great nation. In verse 18, he's now dealing with ha uh, uh, Ishmael's mother. Who is that? Hagar. Hagar. He's Thank you, Jim. I heard you. <laughs> he's dealing with Hagar. He looks at Hagar and says, look, I'm going to make your boy a great nation. So we see God is transitioning from dealing with individuals here into what? Nations. Nations. Okay, go ahead on. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee, Jacob, a great nation. He's talking to Jacob now. What did he tell Jacob? I'm going to make you a great nation. So he's moving into making nations because he's going to deal. He, he knows what he's doing. We read this, and if you don't have any revelation in the mystery, you're going to miss what God is saying and what he's doing in the, his purpose, intent, and plan. We miss it. Religion, desensitization through religion, and what we're talking about here in politics, which we'll get to, desensitizes us to the person of Christ, and we read everything according to what we've heard, just like mm -hmm. Rachel had to say. So, go ahead on, Melinda. And Exodus 9.24 tells us that Egypt was a nation. Mm -hmm. We see Exodus 19.3 and 5-6. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called un unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, mm -hmm. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a, pe a peculiar treasure unto me above mm -hmm. all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. There you go. Now, go ahead. No, no, no. no I'm, I, that, we, well, that's good because that takes us into something else. So he is now telling what? In, in e Exodus 19, and this is before the law. <laughs> this is before Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. right? Because Mount Sinai, they're already really at Mount Sinai, but this is before the law came. Mm -hmm. So they're already at Mount Sinai. But he's telling them that they are what? A holy nation. And the word holy in that verse means what, Sylvia? Set apart. Set apart. Out of all the nations, you are going to be set apart to me. So he's already saying they're no longer a separate people. Now they are a nation. Now his promise to who? Abraham and Jacob mm -hmm. is fulfilled. He is now designating them your nation. So now God's dealing with a nation and not necessarily with technically persons. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We're now dealing with nations. Now you remember at the burning bush? What did God tell Moses? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, individuals. Now he's the God of Israel, a nation. Follow? Mm -hmm. So we see here <clears throat> that God now moved from individuals into what? Nations, he, or people. Now, when he said you are a separate people, and please stay with me. A holy, he has now identified himself with a people. Now he's a nation. And they are his people, his nation. That makes all the other nations around separate. Now God is going to deal with this nation by other nations and other nations through this nation. We'll get to that in a second. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that we see in Isaiah. Isaiah, well, you can read that, my Lynn, if you like. Isaiah the prophet spoke to the nation of Israel. All major and minor prophets spoke to the nation of Israel. Isaiah 55, 5, 
Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Isaiah 60, 12. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. God dealt with the nation of Israel through other nations and other nations by Israel. It was that way until the cross. Okay, so we see in those verses that God spoke about Israel being a nation and other nations, and there were certain things that were going to happen to other nations. They were going to be wasted. So we are looking at God's dealing with nations, right? We're still from Genesis to Malachi. We have not left the Scripture or the Old Testament writings that identified Israel as a nation and those who will come to him, uh, come to them. God punished Israel by what? Nations. God took care of other nations surrounding Israel. He destroyed nations. I mean, th it was dealing with nations. Not, not, that, that, not, not that there's not people, but those people are identified by the nations. So, Sabrina, now, and those of you who are watching, Please keep in mind, the cross was the deciding factor in God dealing with people. The cross was the deciding factor. <clears throat> now, in our little notes here, I want to show you something. Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, had an issue because for centuries, they were separate unto God. They were instructed that the Gentiles were what? Unclean. And so Israel as a nation could not cohabitate. Israel as a nation could not fellowship with other nations because other nations had other gods. And it, you, you, most of you understand the Old Testament writings that are prophets, how God dealt with Israel in blending himself with other nations. Now, we talked about that last week, and hopefully we'll get to that uh, in, a, in a minute because I want to read Samuel again that uh, Catherine read last week and what Israel wanted from, uh, from Samuel to make, give them a what? A king so they could be like other nations. But to answer your question, there's a transition between the cross and the revelation of the mystery that God revealed first to Israel. He let them know he's not dealing with them as a nation anymore, but he's dealing with them as individuals. Now, let's look at these. <clears throat> now, remember, yeah, I, I got it. I want, you to, I want to set the stage. <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth came along, right? I mean, you know that. Jesus of Nazareth came along, and he preached to who? Israel, the Jews. The Jews. He preached to Israel and the Jews. And he asked them to believe on him. He asked them uh, in several places. Uh, he was identified as the son of God, the son of David. At several places, he was identified as the Messiah, which was promised to who? Right. Mm -hmm. Israel, the Jews. You know. Israel and the Jews. They became Israel before they became Jews. So you're right. Both of those are. They're synonymous now. It was a time that they weren't. Matter of fact, they were known as Hebrew, then Israel, then Jews. Historically. So, we're right at this place, Brittany. I don't want to bore you here. <laughs> we're at this place where something is about to take place. God fulfilled his promise to Israel. He brought them a Messiah. And with the Messiah came something. With the Messiah came the end of God dealing with Israel as a nation. Now, Melinda, look at, uh, let's read Acts. Uh, I want to show you where uh, it all started. You know, I think I, how did I do that? Oh, I see what I did. No, I, I see what I did. Yeah. Go ahead and read that Acts 10. Now, l l before my Linda reads, there's three places in Acts that identifies God's dealing with Israel to let them know he's not dealing with them as a nation. That's three places. 
because the Gentiles now are being dealt with as a people, as individuals, not a nation. There's no nation, no Gentile nation. But what God is telling Israel is that you are one. Now, before my Linda reads this, I want to set the stage here at Acts chapter 1. Jesus meets with the disciples before he ascends, right? Mm -hmm. He tells them to go to Jerusalem to the upper room mm -hmm. to wait for what? The Holy Spirit. To wait for the Holy Spirit. Up until this time, Gentiles, Gentiles converted to Judaism. They did not become Israelites. They converted to Judaism. Right. What do you know about that? I probably know quite a bit, but I'm scared to answer. <laughs> Desensitization. <laughs> Desensitization at work. Okay. <laughs> what do you know about that? Well, they were made twice the or a hundred times the right. candidates of hell because right. they were converted right. rather than being saved and to be a, the part of that process was um, being circumcised and it was all physical things they had mm -hmm. to go through. Right. Had nothing to do with the change of heart or right. um, a lifestyle or anything like that. Well, they did have changes. They couldn't eat. Well, that's, true. that's right. They had to follow the dietary. The right. They had to follow the dietary rules of Israel, of the Jews. So Melinda's on track. Uh, Gentiles were converted to Judaism. They went through a process of conversion, and they became what? Proselytes. They became proselytes. In other words, they were Gentiles who converted to Judaism. They never became Jews. They never became Israelites. They were converted to Judaism. And what is so amazing about that, Chris, is that they were baptized. Did you, you know that? They were baptized. You knew that. I know you. See, he knew that. He should be here, not me. <laughs> They were baptized. That, that, really, that really takes us to what? When John the Baptist was baptizing the Jews by the River Jordan and Sanhedrin went down and said, by what authority do you do this? You remember that line? You remember that? Mm -hmm. Why do you think they said that? I don't know. That's a good answer. She said she didn't say I was afraid. She said, I don't know, which is a good answer, which means she said, I'm going to protect myself. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the reason they, they said that was because Jews were not baptized, only Gentiles in conversion to Judaism. Jews weren't baptized. You were born into this thing. You were taught in the synagogue what the law and the prophets stated and how you should live as an Israelite, as a Jew. So when John the Baptist was baptizing, and he was baptizing Jews, the Sanhedrin ran out there and said, by what authority do you do this? Who told you this? Are you that prophet, referring to the Messiah? Are you that one? And then he said, no, I'm not. But there's one that's coming after me who will baptize you with, listen, the Holy Ghost and with fire. That was a key. Technically, that was the end of nations. But let's move on. Jesus is at the, at the mount there. He's about to ascend. He tells them to go to the upper room. And they go to the upper room, and Acts chapter 2 says, and while they were in the upper room praying, what happened? The Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit came, fell on them. They talked and spoke in tongues. Holy, uh, uh, cloven tongues of fire was on them, and they were all just stirred up because that was at the Passover. So this one group of people, then we have Peter's thing. Peter stands up, and he begins to preach the gospel that he had heard that Jesus is the Messiah and you need to believe on him, right? There is no Gentiles involved in this so far. But God has taken Israel as a nation and took them to the cross and have now said, you need to believe on me. All right, read Acts chapter 10. Oh, oh, yes, let me, let me, well, I'm sorry. Malin is starting at verse 44. Now, I can explain this before I let it read and go back. I'd rather do it now because I, I want to move on. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, who is a Gentile, is sitting around, and an angel comes to Cornelius. You know that. What happened? 
and he tells him that uh, or shows the the sheep being let down from heaven where he can eat the the forbidden foods i'm not quite right i'm on, on track yeah. <laughs> you, you, this is part of the same story but i'm not yeah, it is, it is it, right okay <laughs> <laughs> can you help out you can help, help out, out. <laughs> <laughs> okay can you help her out jim See, all, all of them behind the camera, he's shaking it. I know my dear brother here can help his wife. I, what, what happened? <laughs> Sylvia, you're our last chance, babe. <laughs> Joppa. From Joppa and Bring. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, angel told, the angel told Cornelius, God has heard your prayers. That's a break. Because Isaiah tells them God does not hear the prayers of a sinner. Now, is Cornelius Jewish? Cornelius is a Gentile. Okay. He is a Roman centurion, according to verse 1, 2, and 3. He is a Roman centurion. God has now crossed the fence. Not, not, let me say it differently. He did not cross the fence. There was no fence to cross because he took it down at Calvary. So God tells Cornelius, the angels say, God has heard your prayers. He has seen your alms. And so you need to send to Joppa to get one called Simon Peter, who will teach you the things you need to know. That's when Peter had the sheet come down. And, and it, it, because Peter was Jewish. And Peter for him to go live in the house with the Gentiles was against everything he had ever been taught to believe and live as a Jew. Right. That's correct. <laughs> that nation. So now you can read this. All right. Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, you heard that? Now, let's see what they're going to say. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay. You see that the, Je the Jews that was with Peter were astonished that the same thing had been poured out on the Gentiles as was poured out on them in the day of Pentecost. So that tells you something about that verse. That tells you that they had not seen anything like that since the day of Pentecost. They hadn't seen anything like that. And not only did they not see it, it happened to the Gentiles. It happened to them boys across the street. You know that neighborhood that nobody wants to go to? It happened to them boys. I'm down in the... I'm down in the in the in the in the hood the other side of the tracks and i'm not supposed to be there because them boys over there doing stuff that we don't do over here on the other side of the tracks hmm? yeah there is no other side of the tracks the reason this happened god is letting israel know god's letting israel know i'm not dealing with nations now I'm dealing with individuals. Cornelius is an individual. Yes, he's a Gentile, but he is no longer an individual. He's no longer a nation. He's no longer op uh, apart from you. He's the same. So, now look at Acts chapter 11. Now, here was our first break. Here's where we see God's not dealing with nations. He's dealing with individuals. He went to Cornelius, who is a what? Gentile. And it, it, uh, what? An individual. He didn't uh, go yeah. to a nation. He didn't go to a king. He went to a person. All right, look at verse chapter 11. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Now, you understand why they contended with him. They still didn't see a difference. They still saw, we're Jews, them Gentiles. Why are you going across the track to mess with them folk? You know better than being there. You know what them folk do down there. We don't do that kind of stuff. Well, they probably even brought up Old Scripture, I, Old Testament Scripture about how they weren't supposed to be um, associating with them. Or right, they're unclean. Talking with them, right. And, and, and if you read the, the verse, the ne I didn't write verse 3 in here, but verse 3 said, you mean you were sitting down there eating? 
You broke bread with that? You need to get up. You need to go wash yourself. Because that's what they did. They had, to, they had washings when they were going to contaminate it. All right, go ahead. Verse 17. And it wasn't just to go wash your hands at the sink. It was a whole ceremony. It was a ceremony <laughs> yeah, because you, you were unclean. Now, please hear, these are Jews who believed. In what Christ. that Right. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so because they believed Jesus was the Messiah, they were different than all the other Jews that had not believed that the Messiah had come. Verse 17 and 18, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now you understand that's a big jump. Gentiles could only be converted, converted to Judaism. They didn't have the same thing as the Jews. Now, these Jews who believed in Jesus, which was different from the rest of the population of, of Israel, they are seeing that now they have what we have. Who's we? Those who had received the Holy. When, when that was the identifier, the identifier up front from the day of Pentecost was the Holy Ghost would come upon people who believed in Jesus as the Messiah and they would speak with tongues. You read that and in, in, in they spoke with tongues, right? And glorified God. Verse 46, and they heard them speak with tongues and glorify God. That was Gentiles. Gentiles didn't do that. The Jews did that. So you understand, we are now dispensed with nations and dealing with individuals. We're dealing with technically a whole new thing. Okay. Acts 13. 13, 45 through 48. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Amen. So, <clears throat> again, Paul is preaching to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are getting saved. Just like the Jews are getting saved. No ceremonies, no washings. The Holy Spirit is coming upon, and when the Holy Spirit, remember, those who believe were identified because they, the Holy Ghost fell and they spoke with tongues. They glorified God. So now we see in the Gentiles, the last part of the verse, the last verse in Acts is Acts 28, 28. Now, this is what I used last week. Acts 28, 28, God's no longer dealing with nations. He is dealing with, he's dealing with individuals. Why don't you read that? I put 27 down here just to get you an idea, but let's read Acts 28, uh, 28, 27, and 28. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Therefore, because you don't want to hear therefore, that's the key. Therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent is sent God from that moment as far as this is concerned this is another verse but this is what we use because it's the last part of Acts the book of Acts here we're seeing God is no longer dealing with a nation of Israel he's dealing with individuals now listen and after this was written, in A.D. 70, you know what happened in A.D. 70? You know what happened in A.D. 70? You, you guys know what happened in A.D. 70? Okay, sure let me. somebody does. <laughs> I imagine some of you out there do. A.D. 70, the temple in Jerusalem was torn down, destroyed. And to this day, it has not been rebuilt. Why? Because God's not dealing with nations. The nation of Israel is not the issue. Right now, the issue is the son. Right now, the issue is salvation by Christ in the believer, the individual believer. All across the world, 
God is bringing the gospel of his son to people. Now, you might start out in a nation, but I can tell you he's not dealing with you as a nation. The gospel is going into all the parts of the world that those who see and receive Christ become new creations. That will take place, that will last until, and this is, where, this is what, what I was saying, Sabrina said, I was speaking about the millennium. That will last until when? The rapture, thank you. That will last until the rapture. When the rapture takes place, the catching away of the saints, or the parasua, is it in the Greek, the parasua, which means the taking up of the saints, which is the body of Christ. Now, I want to say something that some of you are going to get a little stirred with, so I'm going to say it, because you know me, I like to say stuff to stir people folk up. That's not the bride. That's the body. The body, the body not the bride, the body. So when he takes away the, the body, what is left here is nations. Then Israel is back on track. God begins to deal with nations waiting for the return of who? The groom. Yes. Christ. Yes. Waiting for the return of Christ to come back to this earth. And then there'll be uh, nations and so forth and so on. And, and yes, there will be a, thou a millennial, a thousand year reign of Christ before the serpent is released and so forth and so on. But I'm not trying to uh, do end time studies here as much as I want you to know that we'll be in individual salvation until the rapture. And I got a several, I'm going to ask Jim to put this on the, 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 the note. Uh, I've got some things here about, you know, when one died, all died. That's, I've got verses here that indicate what God is doing with man, the new man. One part of this I just want to touch on. I think you'll, it'll, it'll, it'll show you what I mean. Melinda, I want to skip, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Silvia, you don't have to. It's on your notes. That, I'm talking to everybody else who's listening. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 28. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 28. And we're going to ask our dear sister Melinda to read this for us so we can get a better grip of what we're saying here. And I want to show you, in a way, by the revelation of the mystery, I try not to go outside of that because it gets you in trouble, uh, what the Father did at the cross and the revelation of Christ in the believer. Not in the nation, but in the believer. Melinda, read that, please. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Jew nor Greek can also be race or ethnicity. Bond nor free uh, talks about social status and cultural background. And male nor female gender equality and sexual orientation because in Christ there are none of those things right there is no now listen to what we're saying in June or Greek the Jews were a race of people the Gentiles were a race now if you have a Jew fighting a Gentile you got a, ra a race war if you have Gentiles fighting Gentiles you don't have that why the Jews had 12 tribes right those tribes didn't get along. If, 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 if the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah had a fuss, that was a family squabble. The Gentiles were broken into what? Nations. You had the Jebusites, the Hittites, the, the Kites, the Eats, the Ites. You had all of those folk fighting against one another. That's a family squabble. Today we have more ethnicity. That's why I put ethnicity, ethnicity down. Ethnic and, and, and national identity. Ethnicity, black, white, brown, yellow, green, and or Chinese, African, uh, uh, German, Italian, those are in the Gentile race. So, Jim argues with some black guy and they get into a squabble, some people will say, that, well, that was racially motivated. No. Let me say it. Let me say it. The Bible says when you speak in tongues, you need to do what? Interpret. Let me interpret that. 
Let me interpret that for you. Black and white is not racially motivated because they're the same race. They're all Gentiles. That's a family squabble. The ethnicity is at stake, not race. So, again, because we don't see the revelation of the mystery, we see things on the news about this person did this, this person was black, or this person did this, and we get, and what happens, Satan is in the midst of that, bringing about fear. I, I, I've been amazed, because I used to be a part of that years and years ago. I, I used to be in race relations. I used to do some teaching on that years ago. But I can tell you, I was flat out ignorant of that, because I really thought, that's before the revelation of Christ, I really thought who I was had to do with, with, with being black, and well, who you are, being Caucasian, that was something there that was missing. I need to have you understand my point of view. I need to have you understand, you know, you, you need to know where I come from. And you need to know where I come from. Yeah, you need to know where I come from. <laughs> you need to know where I come from. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, see, you, you, it's a black thing. You can't understand. <laughs> see, you, if you, you understand the, what, what, what we went through in slavery. Now, I just changed from me to us. Uh -huh. What we went through in slavery. years ago. Yeah, 200 years. You, you, if you understood all that, you'd understand how I'm, I, I'm oppressed and how I, I, I've been discriminated against. Uh, but this scripture right here says there is neither Jew nor Greek. Right. There is neither bond nor free. Right. We're all the one in Christ. Right. Because the cross took care of ethnicity, race, cultural differences, gender differences, gender identity, social status. When one died. All died. That ended. Right? You still got Jews that are here. You still got Gentiles. But you got us who is the new creation race. We are third race of people on the face of the planet. God took from both races and created what? A new race. A new creation. New, new creation. That's correct. And I, we touched that on these verses, although I didn't put Ephesians 2, where Paul said, and he have made of twain, Jews and Gentiles, one, man. one new man. Okay? So... With that said, uh, let's move on. Uh, if you will, go back to your notes from last week. We're just going to cover <coughs> some of the things so that I can finish. I can finish what we discussed last week. Um, Sabrina, I hope that helps you. Uh, I know it's a lot, but the notes will be on online, and you'll be able to download and review. And when people say certain things, you'll be not just you, Sabrina, but anybody else who's listening. You can download that clip of the notes and then review it because the real issue is the reason people have trouble with God dealing with individuals and not nations is right where we're going. We're talking about desensitization to the person of Christ and politics. As I said to you last week, uh, let's just review quickly the definition of uh, politics. So, Melinda, you want to read a couple of definitions of politics there? Sure. And then uh, we're right on schedule with all of that. I'm glad. The activities associated with the governance of a country or other area, especially the debate or conflict among individuals or parties, having or hoping to achieve power and control. Mm -hmm. A particular set of political beliefs or principles. Activities that relate to influencing the actions and policies of a government or getting and keeping power in a government. Mm. Politics at its root has the same fear base. Everyone who lives in fear has put hope and trust in a political system. They are looking for the system to provide the answer. Because of desensitization, humans are steeped in political hope. That is so, to me, that is just incredible. There is the same identity or the same desire in religion that our group, our religion, the how I grew up or the house I grew home I grew up in. You know, people say, well, he grew up in a Christian home. That's a, that's a deception. Oh, you mean because they went to church all the time? Oh, you mean because they were involved in programs and so forth and so on? That's, that's what most people mean. And that's the deception. That is desensitization to the person of Christ. Christ is not the issue in that statement. 
because there's no difference between a guy. Let me uh, please stick with me on this because it's really going to. It's kind of a Jesus is verily, verily. Whenever Jesus said verily, verily, watch out because something came out of his mouth that they wasn't ready for. So I'm going to say this to you. There is no difference in growing up in a Christian home than growing up in a crack house. Because the Christian home is subjective. And what makes it subjective is the religion, the religious idea that this makes, that gives you an edge. You say, well, I mean, if you grew up in a house where people were reading the Bible and people were praying, it would seem that they should be, they should be believers. Does that mean that? No, Sylvia's shaking her head. Does that mean that? No. Has nothing to do with it. If it did, if it did, then those who grew up in that environment should have an advantage on salvation. But they don't. They don't. It's no more, more than somebody growing up in a house where the family practiced democratic politics or republican politics. Did you know anything about liberty, freedom? Did you know anything about what went on to make us who we are as a nation? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So, political hope is identical to religious hope. Political hope is identical to religious hope. Today, because of desensitization, they are, they, they are seen as the same. You go to the Republican convention. What do you think is going to be being talked about at the Republican convention? Well, we believe God really wants you to be in office here because we need to take this country back to his roots. We need to take this country. I can tell you, you can't take it anywhere. To do that, you've got to take it out of God's hands. You're going to take it out of God's hands. Don't think you can do that because Jesus said no man can take it from my hands. <laughs> but you got to take it out of God's hands. As though a political party or a politician can straighten things out in this world, in this country. So it is no different than being at the Southern Convention. <laughs> Standing there saying, God wants to, to, to take this country, and we believe as Baptists, we can bring about change, change in America. We believe that. You take that, that, that dear brother, or maybe, and take him out of the Southern Baptist Convention, two weeks later, now he's at the Republican Convention. Or maybe the Democratic Convention, because everybody who's Baptist is not necessarily Republican. And you take him to these conventions, and you hear the same words come out of their mouth. Jesus said, quote, is God divided? <laughs> is he on the side of them or them? We are so inundated with fear that we can't see beyond the flesh. God is not for <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs. Chris, Chris is a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I'm telling you, Chris is a Chiefs fan. He is also a Kansas City Royals fan. So, uh, okay, Chris, God is just for them every other Sunday. How about that? <laughs> God, ask, ask him who God's for when the Royals are playing the Rangers. He's for the Royals. <laughs> Got to be for the Royals. I don't know what good thing come out of the Rangers. <laughs> that boy is a sad news, just like the Cowboys. <laughs> but we have so been desensitized to the personal Christ till we think our religion and our political ideas are the same. God is for us. Who is us? The nation of America. He is not dealing with nations. He's dealing with individuals because in individuals he puts his son, and in his son, in you, you become a new creation and you become a new race of people. This is not our home. Now, again, I said last week, I put a copy of Casting the Winning Vote. Every time you pray and you see God, not based on the politician, I mean, it don't mean you can't hear what the guys are saying, the women are saying, but you got to remember, those people are not fallo uh, uh, what, infallible. And if you vote in fear, your vote is in the flesh. 
I didn't say that, did I? I think you did. <laughs> Let me say it again. If you vote in fear, your vote is in the flesh. If you vote and you have not sought the Father's will, you voted in the flesh. If you check with your father and he says vote for this guy and this guy loses, it doesn't matter to you. Why? Because you're in obedience. Mm -hmm. So our identity is not based on political parties, but on the Son of God who makes us who we are to our Father. And we carry that out in obedience. Listen, no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Well, laying down your life might be casting your vote for somebody that I mean, I, 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 let, let, let me let me move on. I talked to you last week. Catherine read the part about Israel wanting to go to Samuel, mm -hmm. and Samuel uh, they wanted a king, and God said to Samuel, "What that, that last verse, verse seven, mm -hmm. verse seven, mm -hmm. yes." Of the increase of his government and peace, there no. shall no on the other page. Sorry, mm -hmm. seven. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, in all that they say to thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Beloved, mm -hmm. listen to me. Second Samuel seven. Let me say it again. Second Samuel seven. Do you know what Second Samuel seven says? Do you know what 2 Samuel 7 says? How about it? Anybody here know what 2 Samuel You know. Melinda, what is 2 Samuel 7? They rejected God. And for him. No. Oh, no. That's not what you're talking about. I'm sorry. That's 1 Samuel. If my know, people. Should call upon my name. Call by my name. Should humble himself. Pray. pray. Uh -huh. I'll forgive them. I'll forgive. And heal their land. Beloved, listen to me very carefully. That was written to Israel as a nation at that time. I hear that on Christian uh, religious radio all the time. If my people who are called by my name should humble themselves and pray, that was for Israel. That's not for, us to be that's not for believers. God is not trying to make America a better place. America is what it is because God has said this is what it is. Think about this, politically and religiously, because Satan works through both of them at the same time because both of them have access to our hearts and minds more than any other thing than in this present world, more than money, more than sex, more than alcohol, more than drugs. Religion and politics are inundated with hearts and minds of people, and he traps them in fear. Listen to this. Before America came along, the gospel came out, in other countries. Leading the way in the, in the Reformation was Martin Luther. You know where Martin Luther's from? Germany. Germany was in the forefront of the gospel for years. Guess what else? Guess what happened after that? It was England. It was Italy. It was France. I mean, the gospel began to spread. These countries began to spread long before America came about. So what is it that makes us think that America now has a place that has to be politically correct, religiously correct, because if we don't, God's going to destroy us. You heard that? We got to take this thing back. And the only way to take it back, my Linda, is do what? How can we take it back? Vote for the right person. We got to get our party in there. And you can't be in the right party if you're not either conservative, liberal, God forbid, independent. Then you, you, you're on the fence. God spewed you out. <laughs> you need to be hot or cold. Lukewarm, you get spewed out. Lukewarm is equivalent to what? Independence? Mm -hmm. Independence is <laughs> get spewed out. Anyway, <clears throat> let me finish.
I talked to you, my Linda sent me a text last week when I was going over this. I talked to you about the uh, local election. In our town, I didn't have it last week, but she so she sent it to me after we finished. How many people we have in our population of our city? 5,100. 5,100 people. 5,000 people. You would think, five, five, I mean, fuck, come on, 5,000 people. And they went to the, the, the election with all kinds of pointing fingers and people just saying all kinds of things about other people. People telling people not to vote for a person because they have this religious idea. And Catherine had me last week. They're not Al Qaeda. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that? You can't vote for him because he doesn't believe like we believe. Well, what if he's the best person for the office? He can't be because he don't have our faith. He don't believe like us. My favorite word, that's foolishness. That's literally foolishness. How about this? You can't marry him because he's not the same race you are. Mm -hmm. I said race because that's how people see it. You can't marry him because he's not the same race. He's some, he, I mean, you know them folk, they don't, you know how they are. You know how they are. <laughs> That's the same idea when you tell somebody, you shouldn't vote for him because he don't believe like we believe. I'm not, and again, I'm not saying we need to avoid the political process. What I'm saying, the political process is not our answer. Our answer is within us if we're born again. If we got Christ in it, we got God's answer for everything that goes on in this present world. The issue is we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to bring us into newness of who we are and that our vote is not changing the world. Our vote is a part of our obedience to our Father. And that's, that's what I was going to say, David. Oh, go ahead and say it. <laughs> go ahead, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> is that truly living in a life in Christ is about nothing but learning who you are mm -hmm. as a son and then learning to listen to God's voice mm -hmm. and follow him in obedience in everything. Right. And if in you everything. do that, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're following in obedience to God all the time, mm -hmm. then you won't live in fear and you won't live in the flesh and you won't worry and right. stress and all those things. I, I can buy into most of that. Most I can't, of it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the, the issue is this. Obedience does not mean positive response. So. I, I didn't say that. No, no, no. But <laughs> uh, I'm just clarifying. Okay. Obedience don't mean positive response as you see positive. Like I said, you vote for candidate A and they lose. Some people say, well, you wasted your vote. <laughs> no. In obedience, our concern is, in obedience, we're not concerned with failure. We don't live in fear. Not that fear does not attack us. Mm -hmm. We're attacked by fear, but we don't have to be succumbed by fear. Because the love of Christ in us casts out what? Fear. Now, that verse says, perfect love casts out fear. Which means perfect is what? Complete. And mature. So I'm learning to be mature as I obey and not look at outcomes and begin to see the obedience and love to my father produces obedience and love in me. You follow? So when fear comes, I can see it for what it is. No. I'm, I'm not going to buy into that. Remember, fear is fear, but it's not your fear until you buy into it. Once you buy into it, you become captive. Oh, well, you buy into the illusion. Then the illusion brings you into what? Yeah. Deception. In deception, you have captivity. And once you're in captivity, you're dealing with delusional thinking or in medical terms, psychotic thinking. You, right? Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yeah. So, yes, I, I buy into that. But I don't want to make it sound like because you obey, certain things are going to happen. Uh, no. And it won't. You might not even be positive. Man. I've right. recently t uh, got a new job. and You did? Yeah, I did. And, you know, when, it was going th when you're going through that process and you get told no or you get those emails all the time that say we're seeking another more qualified candidate, you know, mm -hmm. 
it's like, <laughs> but I really thought I should apply there. Why am I not getting a job? <laughs> and it's hard to feel that way. It's hard to know that, well, God may have had you apply there for some reason. Maybe that was your practice application before you applied, you know, because I changed my cover letter every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I constantly was updating it, making it better. So maybe he had me saying different words and different things so that mm -hmm. when I applied to the place he wanted me to be at, I was at the confidence level he wanted me to be in the, you know, in the interview and everything. So you just never know. <laughs> well, you know, Paul, I guess we discussed that. Uh, we discussed that not too long ago in Philippians 4. Now, we get everybody familiar with Philippians 4.13. You familiar with that? You familiar with that, right, Chris? I know you have. So you read it more, than ta more time than you can remember. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. Right. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then people jump on that verse and say, I mean, they pick it, it's a verse. And when you're in the midst of something, you jump on that verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not going to let. But see, the key to that verse is not verse 13. The key to that verse is verse 11 and 12, which says, For I have been instructed how to be abased and how to abound. I have learned that whatsoever state I'm in, to be content. I've been instructed how to do without. I've been instructed how to have a lot. But I've learned that whatsoever state I'm in, to be content. If you haven't been instructed and you haven't learned, when you get to verse 13, it's just words on a page. If you haven't learned that your father is in control of this world and the one that created the, the, the universe lives in you and nothing is out of order, you can't take the country back, you can't fix the problems, God the Father in you has made you a light in the midst of what's going on in this world. So when people come to you, when they're looking at, I was at breakfast with a dear brother, and we were talking about these issues that are going on with police shooting uh, a lot of African-American guys and, and, and being acquitted, and it's just stirring up a lot of stuff. And he said to me, if, if, if I was sitting across from Al Sharpton, <laughs> What would I say to him? And I said, to even be concerned about what you say to him means you're in your flesh. I would look at him and say, first of all, you're in your flesh. Because what's going on is, one, part of the Father's plan. Two, it is motivated by fear. God's not fixing African Americans. He's not fixing Caucasians. He's not fixing Hispanics. He's not fixing Germans or Italian. He's not fixing Chinese or Japanese. He's making them new when they receive his son. And in newness, we live above what's going on. Because this will always be here. Where we get trapped is fear tells us, how does this, remember the illusion tells you, how does this affect you? You see what them people are doing? We got to put a stop to that. What about all the people coming under the borders, slipping through? What about the Al-Qaeda, the, the people slipping in, trying to blow us up? All of that is fear-motivated. I'm going to tell you, if you're living and buying into that, you will have desensitization to the person of Christ, if you're a believer in you. But even worse, you won't have that same Christ to give to others when they're facing those fears. So, national election is coming on. Oh, i got to finish. National election is coming next year, 2016, right? Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, next year. Yeah. 2016, we got presidential election. Everybody said, can't get, I can't wait to get rid of Obama. Uh, Catherine was telling me, let me tell you a quick one. Catherine was telling me, when she goes into a patient's room, she got a lot of older patients. And when she goes into a patient's room, she asks them certain questions. What day of the week is it? And, uh, you know, uh, what, what year were you born? She has that information. So she's checking to see if, if they're, you know, coherent. And so she says, some of them can't remember the days, what, day, what year it is. Some of them can't remember what year it is. But she said, who's the president? And she said, no matter how, <laughs> if they can't remember what year it is, they can't remember the day of the week, but all of them say, Obama. <laughs> Till 2016, maybe. <laughs> Till 2016, you can't run again. Till 2016. That shows you the depth. Now, listen to me very carefully. I'm laughing 
but I'm serious before the Father. It shows you the depth of fear in America. It shows you to me. I'm going to say it differently. It shows me the depth of fear in America. I, the, when I gave you last week when I was reading, Catherine was reading that about hell in the handbasket. I heard that before this man was elected. If this man wins, America's going to go to hell in a handbasket. I've always wondered, what is that handbasket? What, what does that mean? <laughs> you ever heard that? Yeah, it's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Who put it in it? Where'd the handbasket come from? Who put it there? God. Fear. Now, Chris just said, you couldn't hear him, but Chris just said that's the media's idea to instill fear in everybody. No matter what side you're on, it's still fear. Let me, let me, let me confirm that with a verse. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said, let me read it to you, and you tell me what you think. Look to Ephesians chapter 2. If you get that before me, my lender, you can read it. Which one? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, when in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Stop. The prince of the power of the air waves. That's what that means. Now, Paul didn't have radio stations and TV stations at that time, but he had the revelation of the mystery. So when he spoke, he spoke something a lot of times that he might not understood what he meant, but he understood what he heard. We do that sometimes. We speak what we hear. We might not understand it. But Paul said, according to the prince of the power of the air waves. The, what happens in California, people on the East Coast might not ever know un, until uh, they, they hear it on radio and TV. So there's something that's going on in California. Somebody's shooting up something. And a, a month later, the same thing is happening in, in, in Kansas. What? Before radio and TV came along, those people in California, whatever they did, the people in Kansas were never affected by it. Radio and TV made that happen. So when you're reading that verse, you're reading the prince of the power. Oh, read it again. Read that verse two again. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of our mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's good. You follow that? So, yes, Chris, you're correct, brother. They're walking according to their flesh. They, 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 I, I don't disagree with radio and TV. I'm just saying you need to see it for what it is. It is a source of the prince of the power of the airwaves to get out here. Remember, Satan is not omnipresent. God is omnipresent, but he is in one place at one time, and he has a network of, 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 of messengers or demons, whichever one you want to use, messengers, but they, they're not omnipresent either, so they have to work through the airwaves. So when you listen at radio and TV, if you're not, if you're not listening to it, in knowing who you are, with a renewed mind, you get sucked. Man, did you see that? How can people listen? How can people vote for this guy? My hope is not in Obama. My hope is not in who some of these. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Cruz or whoever. Who? Rand Paul. You name it. You name him. Every one of those men and women, you're right, found their place at the cross. When one died, all died. I hope it's not in those who were dead, even if they have life in them now. Not a single one of them. I don't care where they go to church. I don't care what their belief system is. It doesn't matter really whether they have Christ in them, technically. Because if they are effective, they're going to be as effective as God wants them to be and no more and no less. Now, that's not, that's not something you hear preachers say. Because everybody want to get you to get involved. I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved. Did I say we shouldn't be involved? No. I didn't say we shouldn't vote. Did I say we shouldn't vote? No. Okay. Did I say you shouldn't 
listen and hear what these people have to say. No. But what I am saying is fear will cause you to get sucked in to the things they're saying so that they could advance in the political process to take them where they believe they need to go. That's okay. Well, with that, sister, you want to say something as we, because I'm done, I'm pretty much done here. <laughs> uh, no, David, I think you've covered it all very well. I, I mean, I, it amazes me. We started joining you guys real regularly a few months ago mm -hmm. um, through the Ustream broadcast, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, I've really been, I guess, the uh, the idea of the spirit of fear has been more prevalent in when you start focusing on things, then those things seem to, you seem to see it everywhere. Do you know mm, what I'm trying to, yeah, I don't know what right, I'm trying to say. I can't right. get it out right. But when you're talking about how fear controls so many people and so many things and what we do and say all the time, mm. as I began to think about that and read more about it and I go to work or I'm at home or whatever, I can just see it. It's like, that's a fear statement. That's a fear statement. Oh my gosh, that's a fear statement. Do you see what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I go, no, I don't see what I said. <laughs> just, you know, but, um, it it does, you know, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Right. But of power and mm. of sound minds. And we don't. Love. Love or power. That's true. Sound That's true. Yeah. Power and of love and of a sound mind. And we don't see that mm -hmm. in ourselves a lot of times because we're not looking at ourselves from Christ in us. We're looking right. at ourselves in the flesh. Correct. Correct. That's good, Melinda. I'm glad you hear that. Uh, I, I don't look at at uh, I, 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 Father ministers to me. I get these emails and feedbacks and so forth and so on. I appreciate that. If you got those things, you can you can send them to us. But I'm going to say whatever the Father gives me. That gets me. I don't say gets me in trouble, but that that sometimes causes conflict. Uh, and and I don't mind the conflict. Uh, the gospel is an offense. That's what Paul tells us. Jesus even said it. The gospel is an offense. Uh, I'm not here to, to quote, offend. I'm just here to share the in Christ position. And people are going to get offended in their flesh anyway, so I'm not trying to avoid that. I'm, I don't try to be politically correct or religiously correct. You know, well, I'm, I'm like Brittany. You know, when it comes to you, just tell them where it is. <laughs> You do, I do think it's interesting, though, that the what's the three things they tell you when you meet somebody new you should never talk about is politics, mm -hmm. religion, religion mm -hmm. and money. Right. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's interesting that po you talk about politics and religion as being two places where people have the most fear and the most emotion mm -hmm. um, involved. And those are the two things that you're instructed in social settings not to discuss with someone new until you get to know them a little bit. Right. <laughs> I, the reason that mm. is is because we put our hope and trust in those two I, those mm. two areas, our eternal hope and our physical well-being. We put them in those two baskets. Maybe that's the hand baskets. Maybe <laughs> there you go. You found them. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what about that, brother? Is that, that the hand baskets? We put them in those hand baskets, and now instead of having two baskets, we put them. Satan has 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 brought it to the place where both. Baskets are just a bigger basket now. It looks looks a lot prettier with both religion and politics being in the same place. So, uh, I don't know what the Father has for us next week. Whether it's on desensitization or revelation. I've seen some good things on revelation of the mystery and the gap since we've had our last broadcast on that. Uh, grace and some other things that I did not put together since then. So, but anyway... Hopefully, we will be able to share with what the Father has. We will share what the Father has for us. I'm not tired of desensitization. You might be, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to do what I have to do. Uh, you do what you want to do because I'm not. Last week, I said this. I'm not here to entertain you. If you're hungry, you'll eat. If you're not, you go somewhere else and eat. I don't, don't make a difference with me. That's not hard. I understand people's flesh. Right, Jim? Jim's giving me the high sign. Look in the background. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my Linda, thank you. Thank you. This was fun. And uh, we trust the Father. We'll see you next week. God bless you, and uh, have a good week in Christ. Okay, he wants me to add a little bit. Well, normally what I do...